All right, okay, let's go. Come on, let's get to work. First Peter chapter three, here we go. We got an outline for you guys. I, I was thinking of not doing an outline because guys don't really like the outlines as much as the wives last week. But if I didn't do an outline for the guys, then I'd get all sorts of emails that I went light on the dudes and heavy on the gals. And so uh, here you go, guys. Here you go. Guys, you ready to fill out an outline? Yeah. Okay, guys. Okay. And uh, um, all right. So uh, really just one verse. We looked at the first six together. Um, ushers are in the aisles if you need a, a Bible. If you're uh, live streaming and you're like, gosh, I want the outline. It's online. Just go to the app, the Horizon app, and uh, you can fill it out electronically. Email it to yourself or to some friends, and uh, it'll just be a great, great, great time together that, uh, uh, that the Lord would just stir us and, and cause for us to become gracists. Gracists. Everyone say gracists. Gracists. And next weekend, uh, gracist families. So we've looked at wives, we looked at husbands, guys tonight, and then the, just everybody under your roof uh, should come next weekend and we'll kind of uh, look at that together. Uh, it'll be great. And, and, and then a, another kind of session on that a little bit more general. And then it's uh, Thanksgiving. So, um, and we're going to set the clocks back, right? So it's really only 547. So I know, I know you all laugh at me, but uh, thank you for your grace. <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. I think we're good. All right. Uh, also, Ephesians 5 tonight, if you can just find that, uh, we'll definitely want to refer to that uh, in our talk uh, on gracist, gracist husbands. But we'll start in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them. The them would be encompassing of the first six verses of chapter 3, all six pertaining and applying to the role of a wife. If you missed that, uh, pick it up on the, on the website and uh, get caught up on that. There's... There's some clutch books uh, that I mentioned to you last week and that have really helped me in this, in this regard, in this series, in this study, and uh, you can pop into the bookshop if you wonder what those are. One I would add this evening would be uh, for the guys, uh, in particular, uh, one that I really have enjoyed as of late is um, Shaken by Tim Tebow. And uh, I just think he's a, just a spot-on godly guy and I'm and happy to uh, recommend his book to you guys for those times in your life or in your business or in your marriage where you feel uh, shaken, and those times will come, and so that's a, a great resource uh, for you as well. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. Okay, so uh, husbands, how many of you just like, feel, yeah, I, under, I understand her, I understand her. Yeah, you're lying if you're raising your hand right now. Absolutely lying. It's a crazy thought, isn't it? To dwell with them with understanding. I've been married 28 years. I'm still trying to understand her. Lord, help me. I need more than Tim Tebow to help me and understand her. Likewise, dwell with them with understanding. We'll look at that. We'll break that down. It'll make a little bit more sense in a few minutes. Giving honor to the wife. As to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace, grace, gracists, gracism, heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered, that your ministry wouldn't be hindered, that your life together would not get snagged and pulled and dragged, but it would be a a, a, a blessing, your life, your marriage. Here's what it would be. Here's what Peter's saying. Your life and marriage would be an answered prayer. An answered prayer. world's not into that. The Lord's definitely into that. The world these days seems to have very little time for God or the things of God. They would 
take a message such as tonight and I, and, and, and pretty, I, I think probably conclude that I am archaic in my thinking, old-fashioned, backwoods. But Peter is just uh, continuing on with this theme of gracism that has now run itself uh, evenly as a thread through what our calling is as citizens in a secular society, how it's to be lived out as we go to work every day in the workplace, and now as it's to be lived out in the health of a home, even if you find yourself married to a backsliding, disobedient, or even unbelieving, unequally yoked spouse. That submission from the wife is not to be dreaded, it's not to be uh, uh, dogged, it's it's not to be hated, it's it's actually to be desired. And I did my best with that uh, last week. It was an awesome message. Um, Fill this in with me on your outline. Y'all got something to write with? We got pins in the back, so dudes, no excuses. I want you to write some things down. Fill this one in with me first. The worst kind of teaching is taught in a vacuum. You need to really understand this in the, in the complexity of the entire counsel of God. And you really need to understand it in context. And the last time you wrote vacuum as a dude was like probably never. So I just kind of wanted you to f- fill in the word vacuum as we get going. Because you haven't touched one in years. <laughs> And if you did, if you were going to vacuum the house, you'd probably pick something like this. This is a Zamboni. You'd probably go with something like that if you were called upon to vacuum the house. But really, this teaching has got to be understood in the totality of Scripture. Lest you go off on some power trip, now having been told that you're married to the weaker vessel. Weaker than who? Well, certainly in context, it isn't saying weaker than the strong. It's actually saying weaker than the weak. Weaker than what we all know that we are, which is, which is desperately in need of some help. That these roles could actually be fulfilled to the glory of God, that our lives could actually be an answer to prayer. We, we, need, we need help. And, 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 the, and the weakness of this, you know, I mean, you probably are sitting next to a wife if you're married, as I have found myself sitting next to mine when a verse like this pops up and she's like, you're going to have to explain that one to me. Because she certainly isn't weak mentally. She certainly isn't weak morally. And she certainly isn't weak spiritually. And I'm guessing she's not the only one in the room that like with all spades, you know, wipes us dudes out. I mean, how many in the house of God would say you married out of your league, amen? Yeah. So she's not weak mentally, morally, spiritually. She's not weak emotionally. I've watched her raise, uh, raise our kids. It's not a job I envy. I don't have any idea how that job somehow got demoted into the bottom shelf. That's like the most greatest, most incredible, most honorable job on the planet. Okay, so well, then where's the weakness? Um, simply here. And, and, and the weaker is described um, certainly not in the areas that we see, not weak mentally or morally or spiritually or emotionally. Well, okay, physically, Bob. Yeah, physically. You can carry more wood than her. <laughs> it, it actually is a word that means that you should cherish her. Like this fine piece of china that just wouldn't be thrown into any cupboard. It means that you are to speak to them gently and you're to treat them gently because, dude, this is you. You know anything about these yetis? This thing can stay cold like for a week, like you. And if I, you know, I wouldn't have a, I wouldn't have a prop for tomorrow, but if I dropped this on the lovely porcelain vessel, it would shatter. Well, I don't really think that's what it means. I really think that... um, The worst kind of teaching is taught in a vacuum, right? What sank the Titanic? 
compartmentalism. Sort of like taking a verse like this and, and, and not seeing it in the totality of Scripture. So speak with them gently. Treat them as a precious, costly vessel. See, here's where the world gets jacked up. Here on, on your outline, here's sort of a, a, a two-line thought for you, just to, just to think on with me. And, and you often hear me say jacked up, so just fill that in with me. It's kind of fun for the guys to write. You know, vacuum, that was fun. A jacked up world doesn't challenge the word. Okay, just stop right there for a second. You're filling that in. It's like this messed up election, this jacked up, this jacked up world doesn't challenge this book at all. This book doesn't need defended. It doesn't need updated. It doesn't need revised. It just needs believed. And as jacked up as the world is, it isn't causing for this book to sort of, oh no, oh no, oh, oh, oh. You know, like when someone comes along and says, as many women do, I'm not, I'm not taking that. I'm not, I'm not weak. Okay, well, um, the Bible says you are. Well, that's why I don't like the Bible. Well, um, listen, sister. He's physically stronger. It's how men are made. Get over it. His shoulders are broader. That's all it means. Well, mine are broader than it. Well, you're an exception. It's not. It's... <laughs> and until the recent failure of this administration, it was the dudes that always went to the front lines. Because we've been taught since little boys, that's what we do. We defend. It's in our nature. It's in our DNA. It's, it's in our wiring. It's interesting, a couple of years, we just got off that cruise to the Mediterranean, and, and um, we're doing it again. It was so popular, we're doing it again. If you want to go, there's, there's, I think it's half full, but there's still room if you want to go on this thing. It is an it, it, epic, life-changing trip of a lifetime. But you'll remember in the Mediterranean a couple years ago, this Costa cruise ship sank off the coast of Italy, and in the middle of the story being recorded, it was told on national news that guys were pushing women out of the way to get to the lifeboat, and it was globally condemned. Globally. Why? Because everyone knows what the role is to be and how we're to get back. Maybe the Lord is just getting us back to the fact of, of what he's talking about, and that's jacked up the world. It's totally jacked, but it hasn't challenged God's word. But you know what does? Fill this in, X line. Uh, it's challenging the word that jacks up the world. That's how the whole mess started, was by challenging the word. See, it isn't the challenges in the world, it's challenging this book, and that's how it all started. That's how it began. That's how the problem began. With a, a serpent saying to a wife, is that really what it says? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what it says. Yeah, he said we're not to, uh, and then she kind of, you know, kind of augmented, you know. Well, he actually said that we're not even to touch it. Well, he never said anything about not touching it. He said don't eat it. But then it even goes further, right, in this unraveling of now what has messed everything up. It isn't the challenging circumstances that surround your life that jack things up, okay? God can miraculously work th through things like that, and I believe in that he will on Tuesday. It's when you begin to challenge this. Is that really what he said? Okay, well, that, here's what the serpent does. Okay, if that's what he said, that really isn't what he meant. Because if you ate of it, you'd be like him, and he doesn't want you to know that. That's what causes the ship to sink. And we get confused. Uh, we get confused. We, we get confused. When we do that, when we start 
when we start challenging, and now it's gotten so confusing because the, the, the gender roles and, 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 and the bathrooms and, and everything's like under attack. Okay, so the world's jacked, Bob, we get it. Um, but why is the church so confused if we have this, the word of God in front of us that so clearly and specifically lays out what our, what our roles are? It's when we begin to question and challenge this and not taking it as the inerrant, inspired, living, God-breathed word that is to be the guide and lamp and guard of our hearts and seal through the Holy Spirit that leads us home. When you, when you, when, when you, when you go there and now challenge this, you got nothing. And that's what's happened, right? That's what's happened because people don't like the roles. They don't like the role of the woman. They don't like the role of the man. They don't like the submission thing. They don't, well, a lot of guys like the submission thing. Those were nice emails. The guys loved it. Um, you know, all the way back there in the garden when everything was perfect, whenever, you know, here, here's, what, here's what the word says. Let's not challenge it. Let's just believe it. There in the beginning, in the beginning, back in Genesis, God gives the man dominion over everything. Dominion over everything. Dominion means power. Guys like this. Dominion means authority. We're into that. Dominion means, um, yeah, control power and, 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 and authority, and, 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 and so much so that every single animal came to the man. I mean, talk about dominion. I don't even think he had to whistle. They just, they just were coming. The dominion was so strong. It was so evident. They just came. And the dominion meant, yeah, power. Yeah, the dominion meant control. The dominion meant, um, I'm the leader, and you're a cow. You're a cow. And guess what? The cow didn't fight back. No, I'm not a cow. It's been a cow ever since. With absolutely no argument or hesitation. You're a cow. You're a horse. You're a dog. Nobody said no. He had dominion. He had control. He had authority. But amongst all that had been created, there was no suitable partner for the man. This is like way before sin even enters. This is way before the mess. This is way before the fall. And he's got a job. And he's going to work every day. And he's got dominion and he's got authority and he's got a duty that he's performing and the animals are behaving. The animals are sort of like, yes, sir, to the dominion, to the authority. It's like hippo, hippo it is. Zebra, zebra it is. But amongst all those, not a single one was found to be equal, suitable as his helpmate. And God knew that he needed help. God knew he needed help even before sin enters the world. It's all part of his design. We need help. We need each other. And so God puts the man into a deep sleep, removes a rib from him, and wakes him up and introduces him to a brand new creature that he isn't told he has dominion over. That changes because now they're partners. And guess what? She can say no. How many men in the room know she can say no? <laughs> she can say no. So how is this relationship gonna get worked out? Because previously it was going awesome because it was all one-sided. And now there's equality, and that's God's design for you, ladies. You were created from his side, equal to him. Different roles, just like the spirit has a different role than the son, and a son has a different role than the father. But they are three in one, and you are so, so equal to us. So like, don't get all tripped up. Well, you, can, you know, he can carry more bricks. Let him carry more bricks. I mean, submit to the, to, the, to the notion and truth that he's going to carry the luggage. Hallelujah. I actually think what God calls him to do and to be is harder than what he calls you to do and be. 
But how does this new partnership get worked out in the arrangement of these two styles that are meant now to come together? Well, let me give you some thoughts. On the outline, nothing can shape or strip. That's a fun, another fun word for the dudes to write. I'm just trying to involve them as much as I can tonight. Jacked up. Yeah. Um, Nothing can shape or strip him of his dignity like, like she can. So you can either like get on board to who he is, and he can get on board to who you are, or you will continue to, 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 to nag and, and pull each other down and, uh, and it, just like for destructive purposes, the thing can actually blow up in your face and wreak all sorts of havoc even in the generations that would follow because of, because of the outcome of it all. Two kind of wives in scripture, right, ladies? In fact, two kind of wives in one verse, if you can find it. You get bonus points in which the verse says that you are the crown of your husband. That's who you want to be. More than anything else that he is desiring to accomplish and, 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 and live for, and uh, you're it. You're the crown. You're to be it. You're to be this precious, fine, expensive. But in that same verse is another wife described. And she's hard to live with because she's not helping to shape him so that she becomes the crown of all of his endeavors and accomplishments. She's actually stripping him of all of his dignity. She's nagging on him. In fact, it says that it'd be better for that dude married to that wife to live on the roof. That in one of those passages in Proverbs, it says it's like a continual dripping. Right? Well, Bob, that isn't that big of a deal. It's continual dripping. Really. That's like waterboard torture in some countries. And simply here, it's us getting back to exactly what God is calling for us to be and the roles that he is desiring to see us lived out. So now as equal partners... Now, as these two that come together, when Adam wakes up, he says, woman, right? Anyone know what that means in Hebrew? Literally, the first word that Adam says when he sees his wife is mine. Now, once sin comes along, that's probably the first word your kids said too. But they said it selfishly. He doesn't. He says it in the completion of who now she is. For him, because the hippo wasn't filling it, and neither was the cow, and neither was the deer, and even the male deer wasn't given pushback saying, Why do you have to call me deer? I don't want to be called deer anymore. I don't think I want to be a deer. It just completely submitted to the dominion and authority. But now we have we have we have these equal parts to which the man responds and says. Giraffe, not mine. Fish, not mine. Bird, not mine. Woman, mine. And that is meant to be an embrace between husband and wife that you never lose sight of and that you never let go of. And the role of those is described for us in Ephesians chapter 5. Right right there. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Here's where it gets a little hard. Let me just, let me just read this to you and, and, and we'll get back to the outline. Okay, here's what it says. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in, come on Saturday night, in everything. That's your role. You're like, I know we heard it last week. All six verses, six verses for the wife, one for the husband. Okay, now he's going to let into the husband probably with more verses. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. And it isn't for you to come up with the idea and definition of what love looks like. Here it is. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So you're never gonna come on her heavy-handed. You're never gonna like smash her. You're never gonna like crack her. It's like, 
Never going to be so moody that you're like ice cold for a whole week and then you're hot for another whole week and no one really knows. How does it work? You're going to love her. How? Like Christ loved the church. Well, how did he love the church? Well, he loved the church by giving his life for her. Gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's what Adam means when he wakes up and he says, mine, in the most positive and accepting and glorious of ways, he says, Esha, mine. Fashion from, from me is, is, the, is the heart to which now Paul says, love her like you love your own body. For he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes. There's two key words on, on how to love her. Nourish and cherish. Look at, look at, look at the rose inside. Look at, beautiful. Nourishing, cherishing. Does this go in the dishwasher? No. <laughs> nourishing, cherishing, nourishing, cherishing. Special place in the house. Nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does The church. Now you fulfill those roles and you're going to shape each other into becoming all that God has for you according to his word. Or you can challenge his word and it's going to jack you up. It's going to cause the whole thing to go sideways. To follow this is to see as we now have learned that the ultimate design and goal of submission, anybody here last weekend, you remember what this is? We spelled it out together that the ultimate design and goal of submission is to Influence. Influence. And that applies to our role in the world as secular as the world is. You lose your influence the moment you stop submitting. That, that, that applies in the, in the most ungodly of, of workplace circumstances. Oh man, Bob, you haven't met my boss. Well, your influence stops the moment that you stop submitting according to Peter. And now that's brought into the home. Influence, even if he's a jerk to you. Even if he's not a believer. We looked at that at length last time. Let me give you a word for the husbands. The ultimate design and the goal of a husband is to, we'll spell it out just like we did last week. I, no, it's not influence. I know some of you are gonna go right there and go, it's the same word. It's not, different roles. And anyone? I. Any? Anyone? Initiate. Thank you. It's to initiate. You're the initiator. Why? Well, because of what you were just told in Ephesians chapter 5 is why. Christ initiated. Christ gave himself. Christ made the first move. You're to initiate. Bob, how does that exactly play itself out? Glad you asked. Real practically, let's look at the outline. Let me give you some ways in which this design and goal of your role as a husband is to be lived out in the home. So that anger, first one, gets resolved. I don't want you to like all living in anger at each other. It's like, like blowing up all the time, having to come in and make appointments in pastoral care. We're busy enough. We're setting up for living activity. We want you to get along. <laughs> and in order for you to get along, someone's got to take the initiative. Someone's got to initiate. Someone's got to initiate. You're fighting with each other so that the anger can be resolved quicker and it doesn't linger on. It isn't still like festering a week later and you're sort of like, oh, wait a minute. Woo, <laughs> Whoa, what was in there? It's just like putrid. It's bitter. It's ugly. It's nasty. 
There's some things in this room that some guys haven't let go of in years. There's some things that are being harbored in the precious heart of this vessel right here. It's been hanging around for years. You got to get it resolved. I'll give you a verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Get over the anger. I know sometimes I even sound like I'm barely scratching the surface on the heaviness of the pain that I know is present. And I don't mean to minimize. But someone's got to be willing to turn the other cheek. And I think it's incumbent upon the guys, if we're going to follow the pattern and the example of, of Christ, to initiate a step. Even if she's 99.9% .9 wrong. For you to initiate the step and say, honey, we got to get, get past this. And I, I just want to start by saying I'm, I'm sorry for how I reacted and for how I responded. And, and I, I want to ask forgiveness. You're like, wait a minute. If you're, you're saying she's 99.9% .9 of the problem. I know, but the pattern and the example, guys, of Jesus when I was 100% wrong is one that he still initiated he didn't even wait for anybody to say they were sorry. He said from the cross, Father, what's he say? Forgive him. And so I think the moment that you just wave the white flag and, 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 and surrender the anger over and, and don't let the sun go down on it again. So that apologies get offered, number two. And they get offered quicker. Just say you're sorry right now. Say sorry. 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 Come on, let's practice in here. Say sorry. Sorry. It's not that hard. It really isn't that hard. It's not that hard. So that we can get over these things and not drag them into another day. So that apologies can get offered. Thirdly, so that emotions can get aroused quicker. So emotions can initiate this, guys. Don't always feel like it's her job. I mean, she lives on words of affirmation and physical touch. Initiate that. Foreplay starts with coffee in the morning. Should be lived out all day long. Texting each other, calling each other, checking in. Song of Solomon chapter one. I just kind of give that, guys, to you. If that isn't your favorite chapter, I don't know, I don't know where you've been reading. You got to be like regularly in that one. That one's awesome. And it just gives you all, all sorts of colorful and wonderful ways to keep that love tank filled, to keep that emotion for each other aroused. That you're there for each other. You're knit together. You're husband and wife now. You're meeting each other's needs. But it isn't all one-sided. And there are times, guys, for you just to Take the initiative there and to do it in a very lovely and gentle way. Fourthly, so that agendas get adjusted. So agendas can get adjusted. And agendas need to get adjusted quicker. That's Ephesians chapter 5. We just read that. Husbands, you got to love your wives like you love your own body. Like, that's huge right there. That's like an agenda-changing verse for the coming week. And this is really easy for you to put into play. Just live it out right in front of her. Just show her in the midst of what you're scheduling for, for, for your life, just how important she is, just how, how precious, 
how precious she is. Just let the, let the phone go off. Like it just went off, like over in this row, where your phone just goes off. <laughs> Which is happening all the more often because we're putting, you know, every, we're pushing everyone to the app and everything. But let's say the phone goes off, you know, and you're like this. You're like, oh, really? Yeah? Is it good? It's that good? Well, I didn't know it was that good. How'd you know it was that good? Really? It was on the, it was on the news. No, I'm not going to go. I'm just going gonna, gonna, gonna to stay here and be with my, I'm going to be with my girl. No, we got plans. It's good. I'm, I'm sure if it's good today, it'll probably, it'll probably be good again. Okay, you guys have fun. Awesome. Bye. Click. Your honey's like, who's that? Well, it's just the guys. What are they doing? Oh, the surf is up, man. It's awesome. It's an epic surf right now. And I love to surf. But I love you more. And they're all going surfing for the next three hours, and you publicly have adjusted your agenda so the one that is meant to be precious knows it. And buddy, that wasn't all that hard. You didn't even have to buy flowers. And you scored. You scored big time. Because there's been a shift in the agenda that has shown her now who matters most. Guys, anger needs resolved. Apologies need to be offered. Emotions need to be aroused. As I'm reading scripture, I'm as challenged as you are that it seems to me that our word is to initiate these things. Initiate the agenda. Initiate the agenda so that it's adjusted, so that she knows. That doesn't mean you don't go to work. It means that while you're working, she knows what you're working for. And it isn't you all about your career and climbing your little two-foot stepladder. It's actually about her. And it's the love of including her in what you're pursuing in the career that allows for there to be a much-needed adjustment in the agenda. Let me just break this down for you. Be around. When something needs done at the house, Allow that to be an opportunity for you to show off. I'm going to get that for you, honey. No, you said, just get up. Get up and serve your wife. Adjust the agenda. Let your fight be a fight over who's going to love each other more in the particular situation and scenario that's being lived out. I love to paddleboard but I'm not gonna go and paddle board with a bunch of yokels down at the harbor if I have an opportunity to spend those three hours with my wife. I've given up golf for all intents and purposes. It's just too time consuming for as busy as I am and I certainly don't wanna take that time away from being with my bride. Now, I don't know what that says to you, but I can certainly say that it says enough for us to be challenged by God's word to simply make sure that we accordingly are adjusting our agendas so they know how precious they are. And we're not gonna hold it against them and say, you know, I didn't go serving yesterday. <laughs> Just to carry these shopping bags around the mall all afternoon. I can certainly assure you I didn't not go. No, 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 that's not loving and that's not treating them as now God's, well, I'm gonna challenge what God's word says. Train wreck. No, initiate. Fifthly, this is hard for every guy in the room, including me. I only preach on what I need to hear. Do you all know that by now? If anyone else benefits, more power to you. This is so that spiritual affections, okay, we dealt with the emotions in number three, okay? We aroused them. We're gonna get there quicker. We're gonna go home and read Song of Solomon chapter one. We're talking about a different sphere of affection now so that spiritual affections get adopted. They get adopted. They get implemented in your home. Psalm chapter five is a great psalm and encourages us to get up a little bit earlier in the morning. Certainly get up earlier on Monday morning. Get up earlier Monday morning. You're here Saturday night. You got another whole hour to sleep, to serve, to love. Sun's gonna be going down quicker where number one is concerned. It's going down a little quicker tomorrow. So you might wanna get on that anger thing a little faster. Sun's going down a little quicker tomorrow. Guys, just letting you know. 
Spiritual affections need to be adopted in your home and that needs to be initiated by you, gentlemen. And again, I don't think that this is rocket science. I don't think it's complicated. I think it's just simply like you were answering the phone when everybody wanted to drag you out to go surfing. That you're gonna say, I haven't been with my honey. She's all into quality time, physical touch. I'm gonna hang out. I'll catch you guys on the next set that rolls in. As easy as that was without having flowers delivered, it is for you to rally the troops around the kitchen table and open up, I don't know, um, Psalm 5. Just open up Psalm 5 for three minutes. Dudes, truly, I think you have overcomplicated this whole thing. I mean, all you got to say is, uh, let's read Psalm 5. Let them read it. You, you don't even have to read it if you don't want to. You're the initiator. <laughs> Dig the roll. Hey, let's read Psalm 5, okay? Um, what do you guys all think that means? Let them talk. You don't even have to talk. You're the initiator. I'm not trying to change you into somebody that you're not. I'm just saying you got to take the lead. Your wife will fill in all the gaps for you. She's just chomping at the bit. You got to initiate it. Dude, she needs to see it coming from you. And so do the kids. And so do the grandkids. Grandpa, you haven't retired from this role. You got to be open up the word when the grandkids are coming over to the house so much that it bugs your son when kids come home and say, you know, Grandpa keeps opening up the Bible. He's reading it to us. It's so interesting. Just read it for three minutes. Ask him, what do you guys think that means? Well, uh, I was kind of thinking maybe it means this. And just agree with them. So initiate it. Let them read it. Agree with what they said. Go golf. I mean, I, 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 I ultimately think that the devil wants to turn this into you guys all thinking that you got to go to seminary. And all you need to do is be faithful in the little things and set forth a little step of faith and watch what God will do. Believe me, he'll do great things even through a mustard seed step of faith, but it needs to be initiated through you. And the times that it has, I'm like with Bon, you know, when the kids are little, I'm like, I think we should just decide that they're gonna get prayed over every night. And the moment she heard me say that, she did not miss a single night praying for our kids. She took it, man. And she ran with it. She needed to see my buy-in and the initiation of us being in that together. Sixthly, so that attacks get anticipated quicker. You don't think attacks are gonna come? Read 1 Peter chapter five. He's lurking around. He is seeing whom he may devour. And you need to anticipate that. You need to make sure as the leader of your home that there aren't cracks in the armor and you're the man, this gentle, lovely vessel that you tuck in with every night. When she hears a noise at two in the morning downstairs, what is she saying? She's saying, well, I'm just gonna let Mr. Big Thermos guy go ahead and keep snoring. I'll go down there with the bat. No, she's like, honey, honey. I think I heard something down there. You need to anticipate what the attack might be. Dude, you're going to do that. You're going to rise to the occasion. Any excuse to get a kitchen knife and a bat and a 12-gauge. You're like all over. You're just like, but spiritually speaking, you don't think that the enemy is out to destroy your kids? You think, well, I just send them to whatever college they want to go to. I really don't need to pray about it or to think about it too much. You know, they need to come to their own decisions in life and stuff. Uh, you're acting like an idiot. You're not anticipating the attacks that are surrounding your kids. And this is our role as guys, seventh, so that the outcomes get accomplished. And the outcomes are right here in God's word. Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven gives us three of them, if you were wondering, that when it's all said and done, you would be able to say simply this, that you fought the good, what guys? Fight. Fight. 
that you finished the race and that you kept the faith. You know, when we were down there talking to the guys about Judges and Gideon and the whole deal from, from all that we learned, and we learned a ton these last couple of weeks have been amazing in men's ministry and this next weekend, I mean this next Wednesday, no exception, guys, come out and be a part of it. Gals as well. We are learning so much. But I kind of wrapped up the outline simply with this. The band's gonna come out. You got triple O's right there. Triple O is like a absolutely wonderful sauce that goes on the hamburgers up in Canada. Triple O sauce, on, that's not what it means. Triple O uh, means out of order, right? You all know that? There's an acronym in the FBI for everything. Triple O means out of order. And it's out of order when the sword of the Lord and of Gideon gets reversed. What gives Gideon the victory is that the sword of the Lord is preceding him in everything that we have studied and looked at together tonight. When you reverse that and all of a sudden Gideon does in chapter eight and it becomes the sword of Gideon. I'm actually gonna build an ephod. And everybody starts performing harlotry around it because he's put himself before the Lord. It's the sword of Gideon and the Lord kind of needed him just a little. No, you needed him for everything. And the sword of the Lord is going to give every husband in this room victory as you would just believe in God's plan and role and design for you as a husband and for your wives as well. Bon and I were reading an article on the Fox News website this morning that was so incredibly insightful. And it talked about just the, the messed up role reversal of everything that's happening in our society and in our world. And it was an article written by a woman, a wife, and primarily written to wives. And it said this. You can go alpha female all you want in your career. And you can go alpha female all you want with society applauding you where the raising of your kids are concerned. But you go alpha female on him and he'll shut down. Gals, for one minute, I just want to speak to you about what I've now shared with your man. And I believe this with all my heart, that the most godly thing that you could do tonight as a precious wife in light of what the Lord has spoken into your husband. And this, as we celebrate communion, I am, I am just humbly submitting this before you ladies as your act of worship on this Saturday evening. And you know what it is? It's gonna blow you away. It's to take that outline that you have so wonderfully filled in for him that you already had plans to tape on the fridge and critique him of in the days to come. Do you remember number eight? <laughs> and before you celebrate communion, now feeling really good about yourselves because you filled every blank in as a submissive and dutiful wife would do. You know what I need you to do with it, ladies? I need you to tear it up. Because if you hold him to this, you will become your worst enemy. And it will become a self-defeating prophecy in your home. He's heard it. And what I need you to do is not figure out every womanly creative way to make sure he doesn't forget it, Bob. I need to help him. No, you need to tear it up and pray. This is your influence. And it will make him into an incredibly godly husband if you let the Lord do the work in him. I was going to grind it up in his meatballs this week. And... <laughs> Would
we all need help. We all need help in becoming who God has called us to be. Amen? That's why we celebrate communion. But you can't continue to emasculate him and then run around town complaining that he isn't man enough. That's crazy. We just need to believe in the power of God's word. The power that forgives us and cleanses us and transforms us to the very image of who pleases God most, and that isn't me, and that isn't you. That's Jesus alive and well in us. Would you give him room to work in your husband, in the preciousness of the heart of your wife? Lord, as we celebrate now, we place our hope and our trust in you and receive your grace over our marriages and our lives, fresh and new, in Jesus' name.